Welcome to QI Connect, our second session of 2021 and our 65th in total. I'm Ruth Glassborough, Director of Improvement at Healthcare Improvement Scotland, and I'm your QI Connect Chair. QI Connect provides an opportunity for colleagues across health and social care and beyond to learn from international leaders in the fields of improvement, innovation and integration. So welcome to QI Connect. I'm now going to pass you over to Jess to tell you how it works and how to use the question and answer function to submit your questions for our speaker today, who I will be introducing shortly. Jess, over to you. Thanks, Ruth. So I'm just going to take you through some housekeeping notes um, for MS Teams live events. So you, sh you will not be able to use your mic or camera in a live event, but you will be able to see and hear the presenters today. Um, at present, it's not possible to interact with other attendees via chat, but you can upvote by liking any submitted questions you'd particularly like to see put to Jason today. Um, if you could please use the Q&A function to submit your question for the speaker, and I'll, I'll talk you through that function in just a second. Um, these will need to be moderated, so it may take a minute or two for your question to show up in the live Q&A. This session will be recorded and by taking part you consent to this and a recording of the session and any resources covered will be made available um, following the session date. OK, so you will find the Q&A panel um, on the top right of your screen. Um, it's the icon shown. Um, if you click on that, it will bring it up on the right hand side of your screen. Um, and you can submit your questions using the text box shown um, and they'll show up in your My Questions tab. Um, they will need to be moderated, so they'll take a wee second to show up in the published questions. Um, we're expecting the Q&A today to be very busy. Um, we have nearly 2,500 people registered for this session. Um, so just to keep the Q&A as, um, as, as clean as possible, um, if you can just um, check first if your question that you want to ask has been already been submitted by someone else. Um, that would just you know, make it much easier for the chair to pick out um, really good questions to put to Jason. Um, what you can do is you can also like your favourite questions, which will upvote them and make them more visible to the chair. Um, and a summary of any resources covered in this session today will be made available with the recording after the session. Thanks. Thank you, Jess. So as well as staff across health and social care services in Scotland, we now have over 1300 organisations linking in to QI Connect and that includes 89 universities and colleges. And some of these organisations are based in other countries, and we now have 65 countries represented in our QI Connect community. Due to the time differences, many of them will be watching this by recording, but for those who are joining in person, please do feel free to flag when asking a question where you're joining us from. It's always lovely um, to hear from individuals across our international community. Next slide, please. So delivering QI Connect is very much a team effort and what an amazing team it is. A big shout out to all of them who make my job so easy. And thanks to the NHS Scotland National Video Conferencing Service who continue to provide us with excellent support for these events. And please remember to tweet as you learn and use the QI Connect hashtag at ConnectQI and do give us a follow if you're not already following us. So I am absolutely delighted today to introduce our speaker, Professor Jason Leach, the National Clinical Director at the Scottish Government who's going to share with us today his insights around leadership through crisis. Jason is well known to many of us on the call today through the leadership he has provided for quality improvement across Scotland and internationally. However, over the last year, 
he has also become a familiar voice and face to the wider Scottish public due to his regular TV and radio appearances. I know my own credibility with my mum went up enormously when she found out that I knew him, given his celebrity status in Scotland. It is because of Jason that we have the world leading Scottish patient safety programme in Scotland, his belief in the power of quality improvement and his relentless focus on spreading the method way beyond safety means that we now benefit from the approach, not just in health, but across a much broader range of public services. He is a phenomenal communicator. It has long been known in the world of QI that the worst speaking slot is any slot that follows Jason. And some of us will pay quite a lot of money not to have that slot. Over the last year, the wider Scottish public have benefited from his many talents and he has played a central role in communicating key messages around COVID-19. I am delighted that he has taken time out of an incredibly busy schedule to join us today to share his leadership reflections from the last year. So Jason, over to you. Ruth, thank you so much. That's an introduction I barely recognise. It's, uh, it's very gracious of you. you. So QI Connect today is jammed between two webinars that I've had to do at this new point in my life to illustrate where my life has ended up. Uh, I am now, not everybody here will be Scottish, but we've just reopened our schools. So in the half hour before this, I've done what we call in Scotland S1 to S3. So that's the first three years of secondary school. I've just done a live Q&A with them. And then immediately we finish this, I do the second half of secondary school the S4 to S6s. So this must be the easiest crowd of the afternoon, I imagine. This surely can't be as difficult as being asked questions about lateral flow testing devices and their reliability by 12 year old children who have understood this pandemic a lot better than many of the adults, let me tell you. So it's absolutely terrific to be asked and I'm just going to share my slides and uh, you should now see a quote. Somebody will interrupt me, I'm sure, if that's not the case. So my plan is to be a little bit reflective. Today is a year since the UK went into lockdown number one on the 23rd of March 2020. Around the time, 190 other countries did approximately the same thing. And it, it's been called in the UK, all four UK, UK countries have declared it a day of reflection. We had a minute silence at 12 o'clock. We're going to have a, a moment of reflection at eight o'clock this evening on doorsteps all over the country. 125,000 people have died in the UK of this virus, at least. In Scotland, that number is around 10,000 with COVID-19, a disease we didn't know about 14 months ago, written on their death certificate. The pandemic which has just swept around the air has been without precedent. There have never been, there have been more deadly epidemics, but they have been more circumscribed. There have been epidemics almost as widespread, but they have been less deadly. Floods, famines, earthquakes and volcanic eruptions have all written their story in terms of human destruction, almost too terrible for comprehension. Yet never before has there been a catastrophe at once so sudden, so devastating and so unusual. Perhaps a Daily Telegraph article or the New York Times? No, the Science Journal of Friday, May the 30th, 1919. The last time the world faced anything even remotely like what we are facing now. And what we are in the middle of just now, I'm afraid, and that single sentence is a little bit depressing, isn't it? But a million people caught this virus in Europe in the last seven days. Brazil has no intensive care beds available today. People are dying because they can't get ventilators in whole swathes of the world. We are not out the other end. Scotland and the UK are on the downward slope of our second wave, and we are hoping and planning to avoid a third wave, but none of that is guaranteed. And I'm sure many of you joining from all over the world have your own story to tell, your own particular reference point in your country. 
This is Dr. Lee. Dr. Lee was one of the first to get this new disease last year, at the beginning of last year. He's in Wuhan, China. He caught what they thought was SARS, old-fashioned SARS, which was a horrible disease, but didn't create a global pandemic. The WHO don't declare global pandemics very often. In fact, this is the first one, the present version of the WHO has ever declared because it needs the definition of a global pandemic is an infectious agent that is a risk to every single human being in the world. That's quite a high bar for a committee to decide. So many infectious agents, of course, are tragic and horrible and kill many people. But it, to reach the bar of being a global pandemic, it went from this part of the world. He wasn't patient zero, but this guy who told us what was happening and they found a new virus. And it's now SARS-CoV-2, the virus that gives you COVID-19. So I have a, I have a great friend uh, called Karen McCluskey. Some of you will know her. Karen McCluskey is the former head of Scotland's Violence Reduction Unit. She is one of the brains behind Scotland's massive reduction in violent crime, particularly amongst young men and gangs. And uh, she's fantastic fun. Uh, in, in meetings, she'll often reach the end of a very, very frustrating meeting and she'll, she'll say, where are the doing words? T tell, tell me what I to do. She, she wants activity. She believes in strategy. She understands vision. She likes a framework just like everybody else, but she wants doing words. And I'm going to give you three doing words that are my lessons just at first glance of the last year that we've seen. They're not right, they're just my impressions. There may be something in them that makes you reflect on your part of the response or your part of the rebuilding. So my first doing word is understand. If you want a sentence, then it's try to understand as best you can. Try and gather the evidence. And that is not as straightforward as it perhaps initially sounds, as I can testify to, having had to do it live on the TV. The difference between this world and the world I used to inhabit is now I have to do the science literally live on the television as it's happening. And that's a slightly different challenge from doing it in a lovely, uh, I was gonna say cuddly, that's maybe not the correct word, a lovely warm environment of quality improvers where I'm used to living. So in order to understand this pandemic, you need data. You need to understand where we've been, where we are, and modeling about where we might get to. This is Tedros, the Director General of the WHO. You'll have seen him and heard from him, I'm sure, in the last year, the former Ethiopian health minister. And when the music stopped, he was in the most important seat in the world. He was leading the global public health response to this pathogen. It has now killed 2.6 million people and infected 120 million, at least. There's actually swathes of sub-Saharan Africa where we don't know how many people have the disease or have died. We don't know what's happening in Russia. We're not sure what's happening in much of the Americas. So this is a, an underestimate of the scale of the horror that this disease has caused. You probably have people who have either lost friends and relatives or close friends or relatives who have been very sick. It is unusual now to find somebody not touched somehow by a disease that we didn't know existed. So when you, when you start to understand it, you need response. You, what, what's your plan? What, what are you going to do? What's your doing words for recovery? So this is the grass market in Edinburgh. It's a major European capital. It's half a mile from the castle. Many of you will have probably sat here having drinks or coffee. It's beside the comedy clubs, the restaurants, the hotels, the bars of Edinburgh. This is it on a normal, semi-sunny Scottish afternoon. You can see people have coats on, even though there's blue sky. This is it a year ago, the first week in April 2020. So our response was to shut the country down. And that's what most countries in the world did. We did it because we had to buy time. We had to buy time to understand the pathogen, 
to try and find treatment, to try and work out what to do next. Uh, we didn't know what to do. No, nobody knew what to do. And people who retrospectively say they knew what to do didn't. The, the pathogen was unknown. We didn't know how it transmitted. We didn't know who it killed. So we put everybody in their houses, literally. We told everybody to stay at home, protect the NHS and save lives. And a version of this happened in Sweden and Estonia and Ethiopia and New Zealand. And there are slight variations on a theme and they had stronger travel restrictions or not so strong travel restrictions. Some did schools, some didn't do schools, but roughly speaking, everybody stayed in the house. And we did it in order for science to catch up. We needed to know both treatment, testing. We needed to work out if we could vaccinate against this disease. And we needed to know what non-pharmaceutical inventions we'd be able to use. And the WHO started to form a response. And there's pages and pages and pages of what they did and what we now follow. This is, I think, one of the neatest frames through which to see recovery. So the WHO say you need six things in order to ease that severe lockdown that you've now seen in Scotland, certainly for the second time. And we're just beginning to come out of it. The First Minister has just today announced some further changes. So criteria number one is drive the transmission, drive the incidence downwards, pretty straightforward. Number two is make sure you have a public health system that can find and trace positive cases and their contacts. So interrupt chains of transmission, find the cases, isolate them, stop it spreading. Number three is protect your institutions. So care homes, hospitals, prisons, places where I that I didn't even know existed where we uh, have people living in uh, institutional type settings, long-term care facilities. Number four is protect places where people go. So if you're going to allow a thing to open, be it a mosque or a cinema, what are you going to do? Where's the hand washing going to be? What are you going to do for schools? How are you going to manage parents? What are you going to do with uh, alcohol gel for four-year-olds at the nursery? Number five is don't import more cases. And crucially, often forgotten, don't export cases. So don't send the Kent variant to France. It turns out the Kent variant is in France. And France now in lockdown again. And Paris has a seven day rate of 400 per 100,000. And then number six, where I've spent quite a lot of my time is engaging with communities engaging with both the public, the five and a half million people in Scotland, the 60 million across the UK, but also with special interest groups, those who deal with diabetes, those who deal with autistic people, those who manage our business interests in the oil and gas sector, whatever sector that might be. And today, talking to uh, young people about lateral flow testing is part of criteria number six. So spend as much time as you can in the communities that you want to change their behaviours. Because the exam question that we're asked as advisors, unfortunately, is not how do you reduce death from coronavirus? That's a quite a straightforward question. Keep everybody, send them food parcels until the virus goes away or dies off. But the reality, of course, is more complex than that. It is to reduce death from coronavirus, but also to reduce non-virus harms to the population. And at the same time, protect the health and care staff who are supporting them, as well as your first responders, those who keep the lights on, those who deliver your food and your vegetables. So the way Scotland has chosen to look at that is through a lens we call the four harm framework. And the four harm framework starts with harm number one, pretty straightforward, COVID harm. So the death and destruction from the virus. Harm number two, what the response to COVID does to your health system, so waiting times mental health uh, waiting times, planned care waiting times, social harm, the toughest to measure, but probably the most important of the harms, loneliness, education closing, what, what it does to the elderly and delirium if you don't let them see their families, economic harm, the straight raw financial harm caused by our response. So we have things in place that can reduce these, but each of them has an impact 
all of its own. And we'll just quickly go through some data that describes that for harm framework. Now, we know we have a, let's call it a quiver of arrows against COVID. We have in Scotland, we have test and protect. In other parts of the world, that's test and trace or whatever your contact tracing system is. We have vaccines now. We'll come to that. We have healthcare improving for those who have the infection. We have dexamethasone, which saved lives, and we didn't know it saved lives until we did trials. We've got ongoing trials for other drugs and medicines for treatment. And then we've got non-pharmacological interventions, physical distancing, face coverings, cleaning surfaces and hands, all the things that we've got to so used to in the last year. Harm number one is pretty straightforward. It's what I described to you right at the beginning. This is Scotland's deaths from the two waves of COVID-19. You can see very clearly the waves of the virus. This is every registered death with COVID anywhere on the death certificate. This is harm number two, health and social care harm. It's like the mortality graph, but upside down. So the grey is the average from 2018-19 for emergency admissions and planned admissions. And you can see the postponed care very clearly in the blue line along the bottom. This is cases we postponed. We didn't do cataracts, hips, knees. And the top line is emergency care that was either cancelled by us or didn't come. And that's almost more worrying. That's people not presenting with real disease. Some of it is because people are not out and not crashing their motorbikes. But some of it is because they're not coming because they think the health service is closed or they think the health service is dangerous. Harm number three, remember social harm. So this is the percentage of children who were attending our essential schools in January. So this is key worker children and what we colloquially called vulnerable children. So only about six and a half percent of children were in school in Scotland in January. Now to put that in perspective, 110,000 children in Scotland get free school meals on Saturdays and Sundays because they are poor enough to need free school meals on Saturdays and Sundays. So closing schools has massive implications for the well-being of our kids. This is crisis grant applications, so still in social harm, but just leaning into economic harm. This is people who apply for social work grants because they don't have enough money to eat or to pay their rent or to turn the lights on. And you can see those grants doubling after lockdown number one. And now we don't have the most recent data, but rising again in lockdown number two. And then raw economic harm. This is unemployment. The uh, modelling for unemployment were in quarter one just of 2021. And unemployment is about 8%. It has doubled since the, out, since the beginning of the pandemic. And what's particularly horrifying about this modelling is it takes five years to recover. So what we're doing now will not be over by the summer, even if we could get back to some level of normality. So I'm sorry to depress you. It's a fairly depressing subject, learning from a global pandemic. There are uh, some positives, which we might come to a little bit later on or in the questioning. But this is Scotland's route map through the last year. And you can see how we've come in and out the diagrams are because Thomas Pugh, a cleverer writer than me, talks about the hammer and the dance. The hammer is the lockdown. The dance is you trying to open. And that's where we are again. We're just dancing out of that second lockdown. Helped, of course, by vaccination. So my first is understand. My second is lead. Now, that seems awfully obvious doesn't it? But a bit like Carden would tell me at the end of a meeting, somebody's going to have to do this. So you're going to have to do stuff. Now, that doesn't mean you need to be the first minister of the country. It doesn't mean you have to have my job, but it does mean you have to do stuff. That might be homeschooling your own children. It might be leading your community practice, but you're going to have to lead to get out of this. Now, I, I don't know what that is in your particular part of the world, or your particular part of the puzzle, just like you can't walk in my shoes, I can't walk in yours. But this is how it sometimes feels, certainly for me. It feels completely and utterly overwhelming. So I have felt more overwhelmed 
in this work than I have ever felt in any of the work I've done up to this point. And who can blame me? Because we've all had that feeling of global pandemic, two and a half million dead, what on earth are we going to do next? And armchair epidemiologists everywhere you look telling you the answer, often two tweets in a row directly contradicting the tweet before, of course, because it's really hard. It's not straightforward. It's really difficult. Now, there are some frameworks that help us here. They don't get us the answer, but they help us perhaps see through some of the answer. And Stacey, many of you will know this work. We haven't got time to do it in any detail, but Stacey is, is a way of thinking about challenges. And you can see the x-axis is certainty. The y-axis is agreement. So do you know what to do? Is there agreement about what to do? Got it? And you end up with chaos in the top right. So far from certainty, far from agreement. And then right in the bottom left hand corner, you get simple problems where you know what to do and everybody agrees with what to do. So let's think just quickly about some examples of COVID. So at the beginning, we're in some form of chaos. We don't know what to do and there is no agreement about what to do. So therefore, you have to use command and control. You can't use PDSA cycles to shut down your country. You have to just shut down the country. The cabinet just have to decide. And they decide on the basis of advice from public health advisors, economic advisors, education advisors. But somebody has to choose. And that, of course, is the job we give to elected politicians. And I'm delighted we give it to them because I certainly don't want to have to make that choice. And then there are things we do know. So we knew instantly that this virus was killed by hand washing. It's certain. Everybody agrees. So we should tell the world to do it. But we don't really care how you do it. We don't care where you put your sink. We don't care that you put it outside the school, inside the school, in the work, outside the work. We do care that you do it for 20 seconds. So we teach you all to sing happy birthday. We put it in every social media outlet you can possibly imagine. And we tell you to wash your hands for 20 seconds. It is simple and certain, but everything else is in the middle. And my example for in the middle is places of worship. There's a whole lecture just on our response to places of worship. It turns out they're very complex environments, both faith-based environments, of course, but also community centers. They are food banks. They are voluntary sector environments. They are all ages. They are some divided into multiple rooms, some on multiple floors, some in the middle of cities, some in the middle of fields. And trying to get a COVID-19 response to that broad sector is really, really difficult. I've spent a huge amount of time with Scotland's faith leaders over the last year, and it's been absolutely fascinating. People who genuinely want to do the right thing, but need your help to find what the right thing is. And that's a complex problem. They want to protect their 80 year old, uh, I was gonna say parishioners, that would only apply in one of these pictures, but they also want to be able to chant. They want to be able to use ablutions in their worship. They want, it just gets so complicated so quickly. So that's where you have to apply it, all of the things we've all learned from quality improvement. You have to understand the system, process map the system. You have to spend time in the system and you have to hear from, forgive the shorthand, the customer. Now that customer might be Scotland's Buddhist community. It might be Scotland's homeless community. It could be the men and women who dive in our oil and gas platforms. And I've spent some time with some weird sectors in the last week, trying to make them COVID safe. The other framework that's helped me for doing word number two is a IHI's leadership framework. Now, those of you who know me will know I've always liked this. It's simplistic. I think that's probably why I like it, but enormously complex when you start to think about it. And IHI, Steve Svensson did this work for IHI some years ago now. There's a white paper if you want it, and it, it talks about a framework for leadership and the things you should do. But the bit I really like is it tells you how to behave. So it's doing words. It tells you how you should be. And I've often spoken about it and used it in coaching and environments where quality improvement has been what we're trying to do, safety or quality or compassion. But I think it also applies in COVID response. 
the five actions, behaviours that you should take. So my version of this, excuse me, is person-centred, but different. So this perhaps in my new world, I hope temporary new world, is user-centredness. So I've spent enormous amounts of time invisible to the BBC and the radio with stakeholder groups, so elite football, the youth game of Scottish football. 500,000 people in Scotland are engaged in grassroots football. So if you want to get half a million people to follow the guidance, you speak to the Scottish FA about how to engage with those people. I've just done, as I said, some work with young Scott today, and I'll do some more uh, right after this to engage with young people. You get the idea. So learn the system, understand it, and be person-centered in it. Number two, behavior number two is frontline engagement. Now my frontline may have moved, but I still think frontline engagement is crucial. I'm not quite so much in intensive care units, but I have walked uh, through Lothian buses to make them safe. I've talked to ScotRail about what it means to make public transport as safe as we possibly can. I've talked to business owners, soft play owners, everybody who you can possibly think of who wants to run an outdoor or an indoor event. I've often given the really difficult ones, of course, to other people. John Harden, who may or may not be listening, is in charge basically of everything that isn't open yet. He's the deputy national clinical director. That comes with the territory, of course. Number three is relentless focus. And in quality improvement, we talk about that as if you need to keep going. Well, in my this world, you have to keep telling the message. Now, some people are fed up with these messages. This happens to be Scotland's version of what you should do. This is our facts guidance, F-A-C-T-S. And the Scots in the crowd will be fed up hearing about facts on the TV, on posters, on TikTok, on every social media platform you can possibly think of. And comms, a lot of my time, have been teaching me about what that relentless focus means and what platforms we should use. The fourth behaviour is transparency. We've given almost daily updates live on television, led usually by the First Minister, sometimes by one of our other ministers. But right at the beginning, she decided that she wanted a clinician beside her every time she did it. And that's what we've done. We haven't done any political briefings without a clinician beside them. Not every country has done it like this, but I think it is the right way to do it. We've also been transparent with our data. All the data we have, we put out. We've got a dashboard that gets updated every day on pretty much everything that we have that we can put on it. I think it's been really, really important. It's been very challenging because not everybody is nice, it turns out. Who knew? So some of that transparency comes at a cost, and that cost is unkind people both to the First Minister, principally actually her, uh, the trolling she gets is truly awful, but even to uh, nice people like me, uh, can you believe it? That is quite so, some quite nasty stuff that goes on behind the scenes. And then the final behaviour is boundarylessness, a made up American word, but it illustrates what we mean. We mean you cannot do COVID response, just like you cannot do quality improvement on drug deaths or on stillbirths without thinking beyond the health and social care system. So this is about everybody gathered around this single aim of reducing COVID harm. From the media to charities, to transportation and politicians, to the health and social care system and people who lead in our communities. So those are the behaviours. And I think those behaviours apply in COVID just like they apply everywhere else. So just to prove that Selena and I and others have been using uh, driver diagrams throughout the pandemic, here is one about leadership. We're not going to go into any detail in it, but it's just to reassure the quality improvement geeks that quality improvement is at the heart of Scotland's COVID response. You can see here open and transparent communication using all the different communication channels available to us, different voices, trusted voices for young people, trusted voices for our minority ethnic communities, trusted voices for our gypsy travellers who find vaccination a bit more of a challenge than some other communities. So we, we reach out to them to try and find people who will help us send that and sell that message. You get the idea. So that's my first two uh, doing words, understand and lead. 
my third and final doing word is breathe. And it's about taking a breath. Now, it's about the well-being of those who have been in the depths and heart of the response. Now, that might be you because of your family. It might be that you're an intensive care nurse who has been genuinely in the heart of the response. It may be you run a care home and you've done probably the toughest shift of all of us. But there are a variety of versions of this, be it homeschooling your own kids and caring for an elderly grandparent or actually as part of your profession or of course both. And it's not just health and social care workers. It turns out that to run a country, you need teachers, you need supermarket workers, you need men and women who fix the pylons and you need health and social care workers. So each of these will need time to heal. I don't know what that looks like for each individual. Uh, some will need more than others. Some are saying, well, I don't know what you're talking about. Let's just let's kick on. Let's just keep going. Others are saying, no, I'm, I'm done. I, I need to not do this anymore. Or I need some time and then I'll come back and do it again. And it's not special for health and social care. It's true of multiple professions and multiple people. In the civil service, for instance, even in the politicians, would you believe it? They are human as well. So one of the great examples of, of very, very acute well-being has been those who have built and led and developed our UK, let's call them the field hospitals. They, they don't particularly like that, but it's the best way of describing it to people from overseas. So this is the Nightingale Hospital in London and our equivalent in Glasgow, the Louisa Jordan Hospital. And inside these, they set up well-being hubs, well-being places that would uh, help these individuals. Free coffee on the way in, more lint bunnies than you've ever seen in your life. Uh, a fitness instructor top left who did uh, exercise classes for those who were working in these environments and vending machines with, uh, unfortunately, non-dentist friendly uh, fizzy juice. You get the idea. It's not magic. It's not going to save the world, but it's just going to make people feel a little bit better about coming to their work and doing the things that we ask them to do by going that extra mile. And there are multiple examples of this all over the world. So back to her science article that we had right at the beginning. It, inside that same document from 1919, it says it is worthwhile to give more attention to the avoidance of unnecessary personal risks and to the promotion of better personal health. Well, it turns out in summary that my great pandemic lesson is not new. Uh, and uh, you may not be surprised to know that the great pandemic lesson is exactly what we've already discovered in quality improvement. And it is that every system is perfectly designed to get the results it gets. Every system is perfectly designed to get the results it gets. And let me illustrate that with one final story. And it's the story of NHS near me, which many of you will know well, Claire Morrison in the bottom right. It basically leads almost single-handedly initially a video conferencing appointment system. So you can phone up and it, you can have your appointment virtually. Now we do that pre-pandemic and people think it's great. We do a few hundred and people think it's great and nobody really engages with it on a large scale, but we keep going. Claire does some person-centered work. She does some customer analysis. She does systems design. She does PDSA. She collects data. She does all kinds of experiments for about two years and then she launches it. The pandemic coincides, not exactly, but roughly speaking with where we want to really scale it up. And the trick here is not that the pandemic got us NHS near me. The pandemic helped us scale it up. The burning platform took what was already a very, very well improved quality improvement thing, a recipe, and invested in it and allowed it to go from 300 a week to something like 17,000 a week. And now people asking specifically for NHS near me appointments. It's not that the pandemic led us to do the, to have the video conferencing. The pandemic just gave us a reason 
to scale it up. And human beings were able to do that. And that is for the QI geeks in the room, the lens of profound knowledge in actual action. And we don't have time to do this in any detail, but this is one of the ways of thinking about quality improvement theory, and it's worthy of lots of study, but it's understanding the system. So Claire went to ask users what they wanted from a video conference appointment process. It turns out the doctors and nurses hated the idea of doing a whole video conferencing clinic. What they wanted was to embed video conferencing into their outpatient clinic. So that's what they did. They embedded appointments into a real life outpatient clinic. So you might see three live patients, two virtual patients and two live patients. She then asked the patients and families what they wanted. Lots of things. One of the most revolutionary things was they said, we want to speak to a receptionist. And Claire thought that seems weird. Why would you want to speak to a receptionist? But they did because they wanted to speak to somebody before they went to the clinical part of their appointment. They didn't want to see the little circle rotating on the screen, not knowing if they were in the waiting room. They wanted to talk to a real human being. And that's what they did. NHS near me has live on screen receptionists who are often in the outpatient clinic. So exactly the same process. You see a, a live human being, you see a virtual human being and you pass them on to the clinic. And we can do that same thing in each of these four uh, circles. The understanding of knowledge, the understanding of variation and how you might use that and the psychology of human beings. My final uh, point though is slightly more flippant. So remember the doing words, understand, lead and breathe. Understand your system, lead wherever you are, whatever you're doing, you, you have responsibility and breathe. Look after yourself and look after those around you. But maybe uh, Doc's advice is better than my advice. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Jason. That was, as always, inspirational. We've had approximately 1,300 people join us live for this event today. I think that's the highest number ever. And the questions have been piling in. We have some fantastic questions for you. Uh, please do keep submitting questions, um, but probably more importantly, given how many we have, if you can keep voting on the ones that are already there so that we can see which are the most popular ones. There's no way we'll have time to ask them all. Um, but I also will use chairs prerogative um, and may pick some of the questions further down that are less voted on. But before I start putting your questions to Jason, uh, first of all, we're going to go to our guest questioner today, Tom Power, who is the Director of People and Culture at NHS Grampian. Tom, lovely to have you join us today. Over to you for your question. Thanks very much, Ruth, and hello, everybody, and thanks, Jason. That was fantastic and a huge amount to reflect on uh, in, in the last sort of 40 minutes or so. Um, I was just wondering um, what beliefs and assumptions that you held um, your role in responding to the pandemic has challenged the most and how that shaped your leadership approach over the last year or so? So I deliberately didn't look at your question, even though they tried to make me look at it, Tom, because I didn't know what it was going to be. It's a great question. So. So I think I've I've learned that the best of the world is still the best of the world. I mean, there are mul multiple stories. You take any one you like. So the Glasgow Central Mosque was making 3000 curries a day, I think, and taking them around to lonely elderly people who weren't able to get out to the shops. My own uh, church kept the only thing my church kept going when we were closed was its food bank. Uh, my own neighbours put slips through everybody's doors with their phone numbers on it. Uh, so, so kindness has been exceptional, and I I think should be applauded, and we should somehow keep it. I don't I don't know quite how to keep it, but also slightly depressingly, I've also seen the the downside of the world. Pe people who have been selfish, people who have been unkind, partly through fear, partly through not understanding what this is, but. I find that so, so difficult. I, I don't mind debate, those of you who know me. I'm very happy with people to take a different view, even if they're wrong. But I I, uh, I, I find anger and and the, the kind of unkind side of that kindness coin 
really, really difficult to understand whether it's directed at the politicians or directed at the public health advisors. That, that's been a little bit tricky. Great, thank you, Jason, and thank you, Tom. So moving on to some of the questions from our audience now. Um, RBD is asking, what impact do you think COVID fatigue will have on leading improvement work in the public sector over the next few years? And how can we mitigate any of those negative impacts? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, COVID fatigue, I think, is overstated. So Steve Riker, the behavioural scientist who's advised the government, who we've got to know a lot, and behind him a whole host of behavioural scientists, told us at the beginning that if you make it engaging, people will engage. People will not get tired if they, if they continue to understand the why, not, not the how. They need to understand the why all the time. And he was right. I didn't believe him. I thought people wouldn't do lockdown for the amount of time they've done it. They wouldn't do the hand washing and the face coverings and people wouldn't wear face coverings on trains. And there are there are people on the edge, of course, who, who don't who don't follow the, the public health guidance. But Steve was right. If you continually talk about the why, then the how becomes really, really quite straightforward. And that's what you've seen us try and do. You, it's no, the marketing department of the Scottish Government is an exceptional uh, set of individuals who talk about the messaging in an entirely different way than I ever have. They do focus groups, they do all of the adverts you see on the telly, the colour of the background is deliberate. So at different stages of the pandemic, the colours have moved, the colours have changed in order to suggest different phases. It turns out, for example, if you want to speak to Orkney, you have to get on the Orkney six o'clock news. There is no point in being on the Channel 4 news. Well, who knew? Because in Orkney, everybody listens to the six o'clock news on Radio Orkney. So if you want to tell Orcadians something, you should probably get on the Orkney news. If you want to tell Oban something, you need to be in the weekly newspaper because Oban takes a weekly newspaper. I haven't had a weekly newspaper for 30 years. So, so you need to adapt your messaging to the behaviour you're facing. And that's true in QI as well as it is in pandemic response. It's the psychology of the lens. The lens of profound knowledge says that one of the four things you should do is understand the psychology of the people who are trying to make that change. Don't impose your version of the world. Understand from their perspective. Walk in their shoes. So I, I think people are knackered and we're going to have to give people time to breathe. That was my third point. But I also think people are ripe for and hungry for change and they, and they want to get back to, to making it better, whatever that might be, whether that's in a care home, a school or whatever that might happen to be in your world. Great, thank you, Jason. I'm, I'm going to move on now and ask a bit more of a personal question around your leadership style here. This is from uh, Jackie McCall. Um, and she's asking you, how do you remain resilient every day and bring a freshness to every media interview? And what has been the most challenging media interview and why? <laughs> so I'm not sure I do bring freshness, Jackie. You're very kind. It, or maybe you don't think I bring freshness either. But it, it, it's kind of you to say. Looks like we've just temporarily lost Jason. Hopefully we'll, we'll be able to get him back shortly. OK, it's the, uh, the joys of broadband. We will just try and get Jason brought back in if you can bear with us for a moment and maybe just take the opportunity to review the questions whilst we're trying to reconnect with him and do keep voting. I am going to be guided by your votes in terms of what I ask him and we've probably got time for a couple more questions if we can bring Jason back in.
do bear with us. We are just trying to get Jason reconnected. And hopefully we will have him live again shortly. Okay, I understand that he should be joining us any moment. Thank you for bearing with us and as I say do keep voting on the questions. Okay, we, our technical advisors are advising us that his account has gone offline. So it looks like he might have experienced a network outage in his local area. We're just going to see if there's any possibility of getting him in on audio. If you can give us an extra minute, we will try and get him back if we can. Um, this is the first time this has happened to us with a, a speaker. Um, unfortunately, it's one of those things that we can't control in terms of the broadband supply, but we are looking to see if we can get him to join in audio. And we'll advise you shortly. Professor Michael, just to let you know that I'm getting a message from Selena and apparently the Scottish Government system has just gone down. OK. So it looks like we're not going to be able to get Jason to rejoin if the Scottish government system has gone down. Um, I am just going to give it. I'm oh, back. he's back online. <laughs> Jason, wonderful to have you back. You were. We understand there was a the Scottish government system went down. I'm going to hand straight back to you so we can make the most of the remaining five minutes we have. Um, and I think you were answering the question around the media. Yeah, tell me again, where did we get to? Oh, resilience. It was Jackie being nice. Jackie telling me that I, I've got energy. Well, I'm not quite sure I have, Jackie, but I, I have a very supportive family who keep my feet on the ground. I have a very important perspective which is I'm not working as hard as many people in the country. So there's a lot of people working harder than me. A care home shift is tougher than my job. So is an intensive care shift. And frankly, so is a shift in ASDA. And I, I, I'm not being glib. I, I genuinely believe that to be true. It, the other thing I have is purpose. And I, and I think purpose is one of the things that's always driven me, whether it's been the Scottish Patient Safety Programme, whether it's been as an SHO oral surgeon, or whether it's now, you can't argue that this is purposeful. And then I've also got a set of things that uh, give give me energy, and that's three meals a day, eight hours sleep, and 5K. So I run every day, I sleep well, and I eat three meals a day. If I can do those three things, I can pretty much go forever. Great advice. And it's really good, Jason, to hear you promoting eight hours sleep as well, the value of sleep. Um, I'm going to move on and ask a question by Charlie Redmond, um, asking if you can talk about some of the key transformations which you've seen this pandemic force into action across healthcare services in the UK. And maybe if you could pick one of the most important ones you've witnessed over the last year. So I, 
So this is controversial. I think this is actually slightly overstated. I, I think uh, much of what we've, we've seen is, is what was already there. People running faster, jumping higher, and working together beautifully. I think there are examples of technical innovation. NHS near me is an obvious one. The expansion of our laboratory system for testing, the creation of a vaccination in uh, literally less than 12 months. So there are technical innovations that have that have come along pre pre uh, publication research that we've used as evidence. There's a lot of that, but actually doubling and trebling intensive care units and buying an extra 800 ventilators. I mean, there's not a huge amount of innovation in there. I mean, it's it's massive and I don't want to underestimate what it took people to do. It was it was huge and big implications. But, I, but I'm not sure the pandemic has driven massive health and social care innovation that, that we would want to hold on to. Uh, others may, may have a different view. I think there are some things we should keep, some of that technical stuff. We should, of course, keep the ventilators in storage for when we maybe potentially need them again. We should keep NHS near and expand it. We should keep mental health helplines for workers and for others. So there are some things in there that, of course, are true, but, but I'm, I don't fully accept the premise of the question. That, that may be slightly controversial. Uh, Jason, we would expect nothing less from you other than to be slightly controversial. Uh, this is probably the last question, depends how long it takes you to answer it, but it, it, I suppose it does build a bit on that. Uh, Janice Malone, who is highlighting that People stepped up in their thousands during the pandemic to volunteer and help their communities. And we have seen amazing stories of selfless contribution um, that are really inspiring. She would love to know how you think volunteering and community action can support us as we come out of the other side of the pandemic and the difference that it could make to society. Yeah, I think it's a great question. I I, I was the keynote speaker pre-pandemic at Scotland's volunteer conference. So I, I love a bit of volunteering. I think it's fantastic. And if you start to calculate the financial impact of even the health and social care volunteers beyond even our unpaid carer community, which is massive in itself, you, you, you realise that you can't run Edinburgh Royal Infirmary without the men and women on the welcome desk who are in the main volunteers who do it for uh, altruistic reasons. And I think the pandemic has has expanded that, has made it better, and we should engage in it. We should make it work. The challenge, of course, is that almost all of that is very local. It, it, you can set the framework nationally. You can allow it nationally and make sure you've got permissions for child protection certificates and all of those things that sometimes slow up. But actually, it has to happen at the grassroots level in the front in the front line. And that's what we need third sector organisations and health boards and other delivery systems to, to make happen. But I couldn't agree more. My my first uh, my first ever healthcare intervention was the WRVS tea room when I was seven years old, when I used to go on a Friday night with my mum who volunteered at the WRVS tea room in Monkman's Hospital. And it is still there. It's now called the Royal Voluntary Service because men are allowed to also serve the cupcakes. But I remember going with a little full glass of Coke and helping a, a full bottle of Coke, the old glass. I'm old enough to remember the old glass bottles of Coke. But it was one of my first uh, impressions of the National Health Service when my mum used to go and volunteer. Thank you. And I, I'm really sorry, but Folks, that's all we have time for today, but a lovely way to finish in terms of that vital importance of all of us and communities going forward. Jason, you've been a superb guest speaker. Um, and for those of us in Scotland, we look forward to seeing you in our sitting rooms sometime, reminding us all to stay safe. Thank you very much for your time today. So, just to highlight that next time in April, we are going to be joined by Professor Becky Malby, who is Professor of Health Systems and Innovation at London South Bank University. 
It promises to be another insightful and thought provoking session, and I do hope that you can all join us for that one. I also want to remind you that, of course, the rest of our back catalogue is available for you to watch and enjoy on our website, or you can visit the QI Connect YouTube channel. So thank you everyone for joining us today and hopefully we will see you next time. Stay safe. Thank you all.